wanted to welcome everyone. Um, we are now live. Um, good evening. I'm Brian Edwards. I'm Dean of the School of Liberal Arts here at Tulane University in New Orleans, although we are in a mediated screen world of Zoom, as I know is quite regular and normal to all of you tuning in. Um, but we're thrilled to welcome you to what is now becoming a tradition. Universities, we love our traditions, and this is one that gives me great pride to um, have helped to create. And this is our now annual Bobby Yan Lectureship in Social me uh, Media and Social Change, which is sponsored by Tulane University School of Liberal Arts. And this evening we'll be featuring director producer Cecilia Alderondo. Um, this event, which uh, initiated last year um, in person, <laughs> um, is a part of the tu Tulane Trailblazers Initiative that started a couple of years ago um, which by President Michael Fitz of T Tulane's president celebrates the contributions of people from diverse backgrounds who have made a substantial and lasting impact at Tulane. And we were thrilled um, to have the opportunity to honor one of our own alums, uh, Bobby Ann, uh, in naming this series um, after him and his own contributions to Tulane and his contributions to media and social change. Uh, Tulane alum Bobby Yan, whose name graces, graces this lectureship series, is obviously one of the trailblazers at Tulane. He's a 1995 graduate um, who majored in communication studies, we're proud to say, as we have the chair of the Department of Communication Studies with us tonight. Bobby Yan is a second generation Chinese American director and writer from New York City. Um, while he's at Tulane, and one of the joys of my job is to get to meet our alums who are here before me, and, and when I remember when we first um, started talking, Bobby, just to get a chance to know you, it was just uh, really exciting and, and inspiring to me. Um, and I learned that while you're at Tulane, he founded um, our Asian American Student Union, which not only exists to this day, but last time when we had this event, you were here, they were very excited to meet you and to fet you, and it made all sorts of connections with you, which has been great and, and really uh, wonderful to see. After graduating from Tulane, Bobby earned a master's degree in visual effects from NYU. And he is, and get this, a seven time Emmy winner um, for sports television and has directed over 100 music videos and commercials. Uh, he's participated in the ABC Disney directing program as well as Ryan Murphy's half initiative mentorship program. I know, and I'm not gonna spill the beans that he's working on um, some a really wonderful uh, film right now that I'm, you know, with the next time we do this, I hope uh, I'm going to be able to celebrate as well with yet another award and yet another area of film and media. Um, with the Bobby Yan Lectureship in Media and Social Change, the School of Liberal Arts pays uh, tribute both to Bobby's career in TV, film, and media, and the commitments that he had as far back as his, his own student days to positive social change uh, and is brought through in his own work uh, in which he tells the stories of underrepresented people and cultures. Uh, and I've asked Bobby to join us. We always like to invite him to these events. And so it's, it's on Zoom. He didn't have to leave New York to do so, unfortunately, because we would have a nice meal afterwards. Uh, but I asked him just to say just a couple of words um, as we would have done here in person. So Bobby, let me turn it over to you briefly um, to say something to us all. Thanks. Hey, uh, thanks, Dean. I, was, I really appreciate this. Um, I guess I'll just start really, I'll make this really short and sweet. Um, so thank you, Dean Edwards, Professor. Uh, President Fitz and everybody, Anna Lopez, all the faculty and staff, Carolyn, Barbara, Pierre, that have uh, been gracious enough to, to include me in this. And I'm honored to have a, a series in my name. But more importantly, I guess I, I'll just make it quick about why it's significant and why I take that honor very seriously is because I think my time at Tulane definitely helped me find my voice. You know, when I came here in New Orleans and when I was 17 years old, you know, I came as a young child looking for who I was. And by the time I graduated Tulane, um, I contribute almost all of that to my time at the school, you know, and, and the time at the school with making amazing friends that are lifelong friends to this day, as well as um, uh, the students, as well as banding together with a bunch of students to create ASU, the Asian American Student Union, as well as creating solidarity with the uh, African American Student Union, Carolyn Barber Pierre, the Multicultural Affairs Office, it really did define my experience there very strongly. And most importantly, it made me find my mission as a filmmaker today to, to create work that is looking for change, positive change. You know, So I think events such as this, which I think is really special because I can look back at my time at Tulane and remember the events that shaped me you know, so I say this to you, Cecilia, you are helping shape, hopefully, 
uh, future filmmakers or even just future people that are inspiring to do something to make the world a better place. And it's these little acts, these little acts of uh, you speaking out, you representing who you are, it's important. So to me, I take that very proudly. So I thank you. I thank Tulane for that. And, you know, I'll say when I, when I came out of here at Tulane, I felt like a different person. And from Tulane University to the staff, to the students, to the city itself, which is absolutely magical. As we all know, New Orleans is magical from the culture, the history, it's a wonderful place. So I'm basically saying I salute Tulane for all you have done and what you are continuing to do with uh, President Fitz and I, I, you have my full support. So thank you. Bobby, thank you so much. Um, before I turn over to um, Ana Lopez and introduce, I, 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 it is really inspiring. And I really loved watching last year, Bobby, you meet with the students. I, I like to say the educators, is, we have, we've had a very difficult year, needless to say. Um, and uh, but educators, I like to say, have to be optimists because we're always, uh, and we are kind of naturally optimists. We're always training. The students keep getting younger, the joke goes. We stay the same age and the students keep getting younger. But they realize you have to be optimists because we see every day that the students here in front of us are going to outlive us. And um, and we're really working for their uh, positive co uh, commitments and their positive future. So thank you, Bobby, for those words. And again, thank you, Cecilia Aldarondo, for joining us. Let me, in order to give a proper introduction to you and your work, I've asked um, Ana Lopez um, uh, to, to do so. Let me briefly introduce Ana, because she is one of the incredible lights of our university. She's a professor of communication studies, director of the Cuban and Caribbean Studies uh, Institute, and also serves as the associate provost for faculty affairs and perhaps most importantly for our group today uh, is the chair of the Department of Communication Studies. Um, Bobby, you're an alum of that uh, department, so happy to have her here. Her own research um, is focused on Latin American and Latino Latina film and cultural studies. She's a co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to Latin American Cinema and the editor in chief of the journal Studies in Spanish and Latin American uh, Cinemas. She is also author of a collection of essays called Hollywood, Nuestra America y los Latinos, um, and co-editor of three collections of essays on Latin American city, uh, on Latin American cinema, with, and also the author of more than three dozen essays in the field. You can see she's a great scholar, expert, aficionada, and, um, and just a terrific um, colleague to us all. And Ana, thank you for bringing Cecilia uh, to us in the series, and I'll turn over to you for an introduction, um, and I'll disappear. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. That's a very generous introduction, as everyone can tell. Uh, I mean, when Bobby Yang graduated, I was already at Tulane. So, you know, it's 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 been a nice long journey. Bobby, I don't think you ever took one of my classes, but I wonder, perhaps you did. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Cecilia Aldarondo. I had the great pleasure of meeting Cecilia earlier this year, um, and where we engaged in, in, a, in a fantastic question and answer session. Uh, after her um, feature film Landfall premiered, not premiered, but was shown at uh, the New Orleans Film Festival. Um, so I'm delighted to see her again. I'm delighted to see you again, Cecilia, and very happy that we were able to make your Bobby Yan lectureship uh, a possibility. Cecilia is an award-winning director, uh, producer, and I would hazard writer as well uh, from the Puerto Rican diaspora. Uh, whose films always straddle the intersection of politics and poetics. Um, she has, her work has been um, supported, funded, and instigated by a veritable who's who of funding agencies. Um, I could go through the list, but let me just, you know, throw out there, you know, Sundance, um, Point of View, POV, HBO, ITVS, the uh, Guggenheim Foundation, um, she is, she has had a meteoric uh, filmmaking career, um, especially when we consider that she is essentially self-taught in filmmaking. Uh, so, so much for you guys studying film at the university, right? You, you go for the theory. That's what Cecilia did, right? She has multiple graduate degrees. In fact, Cecilia, you went to school with one of our young faculty, Thorn Chen, who remembers you fondly from those days up in the frozen tundra. Um, her first uh, feature film um, documentary was Memories of a Penitent Heart, which premiered in 2016 at the Tribeca Film Fest and was broadcast on POV in, in 2017. 
um, Memories is a, um, opens up, it's a family film. It's a family chronicle film, which opens up a veritable Pandora's box of family, of her own family's um, melodramatic past as she unfolds the story of her uncle Miguel, who died in the late 1980s of AIDS in the heart of a very Catholic and conservative family. Um, her second feature film, Landfall, uh, which is the film that, that showed at uh, the New Orleans Film Fest, has had thus far a stellar release. It too was premiered at Tribeca. Um, and I think uh, Tribeca, Tribeca's blurb for the film to, insult, to encourage audiences was very, it's, it's lovely. It was when worlds, when the world falls apart, who do we become? Because that's really what in many ways Landfall is about. Uh, I am not going to um, say any more about the films. We'll have the opportunity to engage in a conversation with Cecilia. I am happy to have that conversation with her again, but I will also be happy to um, see what audience uh, questions uh, appear on the chat. Um, and I'll add um, as a final nod to Cecilia's accomplishments that she is also an assistant professor at Williams College. So she is one of us academics. Welcome Cecilia. Thank you so much, Anna, for that beautiful introduction. I'm so happy to get to talk to you again. Um, I've done um, so many conversations about landfall over the past uh, nine months or so, or however long it's been. Um, but ours was one of uh, my favorites for sure. And so I'm very excited to keep talking with you. Um, and I just want to thank everybody at Tulane who made this talk happen. And of course, I would much rather be with all of you in a crowded lecture hall, um, but um, I am excited to see a few friendly faces or names, at least uh, Thorne, I know you're here, and also Angela Tucker, who I also know and admire very much. So um, I'm excited to hear from all of you um, in the discussion afterwards. Um, I am joining you tonight from unceded Mohican land known as Catskill, New York. Um, and uh, I am currently in uh, my office, um, but I will try and be with you as much as I can. Um, I'm gonna say that this talk is going to be touching on some really difficult and painful subject matter, but um, I hope that you can see sort of, I'm glad that Anna brought up that tagline, which I'm just gonna say, I wrote that, Tribeca didn't, but we can talk about, about film marketing in the, in the discussion. But um, uh, the reason I wanted to mention that is that um, for me, all the work that I make um, has been incredibly transformative personally, as well as I hope politically, and um, and so I just want to say that while we're going to be talking about um, you know this idea that we're in this moment of of great difficulty, um, we're also going to talk about community and um, and the reparative work that that comes with um, with with making making films during difficult times. So. Um, yeah, without uh, further ado, then I'll just get started. Um, so everywhere I look, I feel like something is slipping away. Uh, our planet's health, all kinds of safety, even our sense of possible futures. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling this way sometimes. My filmmaking has always taken a poetic and intimate cast, traits that can seem ill-suited to tackling pressing social issues. Yet I've come to believe that in this moment of tremendous suffering and uncertainty, poetics and intimacy offer a way through the cacophony, through the instability, and through the distraction that have come to define our present era. And um, I'm just gonna pause to share my screen for a moment so I can walk you through a few things. Um, here we go, okay. So I make intimate personal documentary films that telescope outward onto broader social and existential issues. They include sexuality, bigotry, family, and religion. As a Puerto Rican artist raised in diaspora, as uh, Anna mentioned, I'm afflicted by what I found to feel is a particular disease of unbelonging. My hyphenated upbringing caught between aquí y allá, here and there, means I have always found myself navigating between categories and seeking answers in the cracks. Puerto Rico is one of the world's greatest non-places. And when I say that, I do not use that term 
non-place facetiously. I certainly don't think Puerto Rico is a non-place, but in the global imaginary, Puerto Rico functions as a kind of floating contradiction. In the very rare occasions when it features on the global stage at all, it is usually discussed as a kind of head scratcher, as if the world says, oh yeah, Puerto Rico, or Puerto Rico in most cases, what is it anyway? This kind of existential schizophrenia defies our hopes for a coherent identity. And we can talk about the, 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 the reasons why in Puerto Rico flag waving is so important and very different than I think flag waving is in the United States. Um, and yet Puerto Rico is very much a place like any other as any Puerto Rican, actually, sorry, it is very much a place unlike any other as any Puerto Rican will go to their grave telling you. So my work holds these contradictions to be true at once. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on memory, which is a central theme across my work. I've always had a penchant for signals of the past, be they graveyards, taxidermy, or sentimental keepsakes. I've been particularly interested in the way in which memory is characterized by contingency. Memory is a type of human experience that is both elusive and essential. We can think of Marcel Proust here, and the involuntary memory conjured by the famous Petite Madeleine in his novel, In Search of Lost Time, that little cookie dipped in tea that sends the book's protagonist tumbling back into his childhood when he tastes it. In Proust's configuration, involuntary memory is simultaneously able to disorient and mobilize our experience. Memories can unmoor and defamiliarize us even as they animate our present actions. Driven by chance, Involuntary memory makes possible an unforeseen encounter with the past that is bewildering and elusive as the past simultaneously fades and yet refuses to disappear. As Anna said, I didn't go to film school. Instead, I started out in the film critic lane of life. My first job out of college was as a programming assistant at the Florida Film Festival, and I ended up doing things like writing exhibition reviews for art magazines, and then I went to grad school. I spent the next decade after college um, surrounded by art and artists, but never quite daring to become one. Um, and I think this is an aside, is a part of the tacit pressure, or sometimes explicit pressure, that um, communities of color can place on our children. You know, it's become a doctor or a lawyer, don't become an artist. Um, so anyway, we can go into the, that, that whole thing in, in our discussions, but I stumbled into making my first film Memories of a Penitent Heart uh, while I was writing my PhD dissertation at the University of Minnesota. That project explored a phenomenon that I called the documentary encounter. What happens when human beings come upon the remains of an event? I was interested in the serendipitous encounters with what I felt was a stubborn symptomatic materiality that could trigger long buried memories. Um, so I was looking at, you know, artists that are look are working with found materials, and I was really interested in um, the notion of the archive. Um, but I, I, there were a number of case studies that I wrote about in my dissertation, and one of them was a personal one. Um, I, I wrote about a box of eight millimeter home movies and photographs that my mother discovered in her garage in 2008. So um, my mother, who was kind of a pack rat after my grandfather died, she was um, going through some of his stuff and she found this box of uh, eight millimeter home movies and slides. And she, knowing I was the sort of, you know, resident film nerd in the family, called me up and said, you can do whatever you want with this stuff as long as you put it on a DVD for me and digitize it. Um, and little did she know what I would end up doing with it. Um, but so I was going through all of this, this sort of, um, you know, smelly, vinegary family archive, and there were all these amazing slides that were decaying in interesting ways. Um, and as I was doing so, I started thinking about my uncle, Miguel, who died when I was only six uh, in 1987. And, um, you know, when he died um, when I barely had a memory. And, um, and I'll show you a clip um, from the beginning of the film in which I talk a little bit about this, but I, I why don't I show the opening of the film and then I'll and then I'll say a bit more. Mira, yo tengo ahí un video que hice hace como 25 años de mis hermanas. 
de muchas de ellas fueron las últimas palabras que tenemos grabadas. Pero yo lo que quería era, en ese video, recordarla, que era la parte bonita de aquella familia. Más nunca yo hubiera pensado en sacar un, 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 una cosita que pudiera manchillar la familia. Yo no lo haría. If we only remember the good things about the people we love, what do we lose? My grandmother Carmen was the unofficial family archivist. She didn't just keep the family history, she wrote it. After my uncle Miguel died in 1987, she made this scrapbook. This is how she remembered him. The talented young actor headed for Broadway. The Miguel in this scrapbook seems like the son my grandmother wanted not the one she had. I have only one memory of him. I was six years old. So, um, sorry. Um, so my uncle died, as I mentioned, um, when I was only six years old. And, sorry, I'm trying to get this to pause it. It won't let me, hold on a second. Um, just do this. And um, so my, my memory was just barely forming. And um, one memory I had was of his funeral, um, which was really my first brush with death, my first um, experience seeing adults weeping. Um, and it was a really intense set of memories. So when I started um, digging through this material, I, 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 I just started thinking about this uncle um, and um, wondering, started piecing together some of the things that I had heard over the years about him, that he was this talented actor, that he was um, very charming, that he was going places. Um, but then there was sort of this other story that I, I, I like to say was told out of the sides of people's mouths. Um, people would, there was the gossipy side of it. Um, he was gay, um, he, uh, he might've had AIDS. Um, and also there were stories about this, um, partner or boyfriend that he had had, a I man named Robert. Um, and, um, and people were just sort of, you know, casual about this. My, my, when I say people, I mean my mother, my father, my siblings, um, you know, oh, I wonder what happened to him. We don't really know what happened to Robert. Um, and with all of this with my grandmother, who um, in many ways um, was a, a real hero of mine, um, but also a very, very, very intensely religious person, very Catholic. And um, as I, um, you know, started doing this digging um, of the past, I, um, I really um, started to, I had this sort of crisis of, of having to understand my, my grandmother um, as somebody who had done some really terrible things. Um, so the film in many ways is a kind of detective story in which I go looking um, for symptoms of this buried family history, but also for, uh, for this man, Robert who I eventually found. Um, and this, uh, this when I found uh, Robert, his name is actually Aquin. He is, uh, he uh, adopted uh, a new name as part of his new life. Um, he had his own archive um, with him. Um, and this photo on your left, on the left was um, uh, in his possession. So in many ways, this is a film about archives. Uh, it's about, uh, in particular, the kinds of amateur archives that, um, that I think are endemic to the narration of marginal histories. Think about people on, in marginal communities maybe don't have access to the official archives, so we keep our own. Um, and as Jacques Derrida declared in Archive Fever, quote, there is no political power without control of the archive, if not of memory. 
Um, so he who controls the archive then controls what we can know about the past. What gets stored is not neutral. It's not, an, um, it's, it's not merely accidental. Um, and so I began to understand my grandmother, um, not merely as somebody who was maybe um, prejudiced or bigoted, um, although I certainly was trying to understand her homophobia, but I was also trying to understand her as an amateur representative of colonial ideology. My grandmother was an embodiment of the social forces that surrounded her, that produced her, the Catholic Church, and particularly the US colonial project in Puerto Rico. So, um, you know, all of this was um, what I was thinking about. And I was thinking about the archive, again, not as not a, a value neutral site for housing memory, but actually a central instrument for colonial conquest, whereby the control of information is actually central to the control of bodies, control of lands, control of resources by the empire. So an amateur archive like my family's both reproduces and also in certain ways resists US colonial interests. So this is a project that interrogates uh, this idea of the ethics of custodianship. So here I am a, a generation later, um, I'm kind of, a, I become a living guardian of my family's archive and the film, and, and I had to ask myself, and that's one of the things about making personal films is there's the life you're living and then the film you're making and they um, always intersect. Um, what do I owe the people that came before me? What do I owe my uncle? What do I owe my grandmother? What do I owe the living? Um, and, and by the same token, what injustices might go undressed if I don't ask questions? Um, so I think back to the woman at the very beginning of the clip that I showed you, who was my grandmother's be best friend and sort of her living uh, representative on earth um, telling me, you know, really this is not for you to um, ask questions about. What happens if I don't ask those questions? So uh, I went looking for Aquin and I found him. Um, this is a sort of sense of all the archival sifting that I was doing. Um, and um, when, when putting this together, I really, I literally was chasing down all the remnants of my uncle's life. It was quite a material um, project. And um, in, in putting this together, when we were editing the film, my editor, Hannah and I, uh, we were trying to think about the ways that a, typ a typical historical documentary might present archival material, but they just sort of present it as neutral evidence. It's a, you show a photograph, it's proof of something. A document is proof of something. And instead we wanted to read the archive symptomatically. How do we think, read against the grain, not only what's there, but to think about what's absent. So I'm gonna show you an example of this. This is a photograph that Aquin had in his possession when I met him. It was part of this, this archive that he had kept. And uh, when he showed me this photograph, I looked at it and I said, I know that leg, that leg, I, I recognize that. That's my mother's leg. And I know this photo because I've seen this photo. Um, and this is the photo that my family has. So at some point, somewhere, somehow, uh, somebody cut this photo. And so there's a scene in the film in which we unpack that. And I asked my mother, and I also ask Aquin, Aquin, and they have very different stories about who cut the photo. But it becomes a, a you know, these, these, these things that we think of as, as sort of mere evidence become symptoms of, of family dynamics, of, you know, uh, of resentment, of, of broken relationships. Um, so I'm gonna show you another scene uh, from the film in which Aquin is narrating his experience of my uncle's funeral. Now I mentioned that um, my uncle's funeral was one of the first things I remembered about him, um, but I had no idea that Aquin was present at that funeral. So as much as it was this important thing that seared me, uh, nobody talked about the fact that Aquin was there and this was in Puerto Rico. So he, he, he flew to Puerto Rico when was at the funeral and nobody told me about this. So um, this is him narrating his experience of the funeral from his perspective. I was at the funeral party, I was just sitting there. They never said hello to me, nothing. I was in the last, in the last pew, the bell started ringing at the church and they put the casket in. I saw the beginning of the casket and I just collapsed right on the floor. <sighs> Every thought, my dreams had gone. Every, my goal was gone. My... I wanted to get over just to touch the coffin, just say goodbye, you know, put my hand on it and say goodbye, pal. So I just put on it and said goodbye. I went, goodbye, pal. I'll see you. I'll see you in the next life.
So one of the things I'm reading here, other survivors include his mother, Carmen, a brother, Jorge, 33, and a sister, Nilda, 35. How do you feel when you hear that? Horrible. They're not mention of me at all. They never meant, they, it was like I never existed. So who are you most angry at? I don't know at times. I get so confused, you know? I really do. You know, Michael, times. I see that face and I get angry sometimes. Really angry at him. So in this scene, we can't just look for what is there, what remains. We have to look for what is not. Um, we have to read this, these materials euphemistically, the euphemisms of Miguel's death certificate, things like natural causes, never married. Um, we have to see it in the wholesale exclusion of his partner from his obituary, in uh, Miguel's burial in the family plot in Puerto Rico. Um, basically, Miguel's chosen family, not just Aquin, but a whole community of friends, his chosen family was left with no public memorials to speak of. So in making this film, it's, I, I ended up coming to sketch the contours, the outline of a terrible nothingness, a kind of negative space where Miguel and his rightful memory should have been. And along with that nothingness, I came up against a feeling that my family had not simply forgotten Miguel or simply remember, selectively remembered him. My family had actually helped to create a mountain of unresolved grief for those friends and lovers who lacked the legitimacy to properly mourn him. So in a certain way, um, Memories of a Penitent Heart has a kind of allegorical feel in that I know that Miguel is not the only one, not by a long shot. Um, and so in my work, individual and collective memory are always interconnected and are in inextricably connected. I see an undeniable parallel between my family's very personal forgetting and the forgotten genocide of the AIDS crisis. Now. When I started making this film, I came of age in the 90s, and I have to say that I was ill-prepared for the coming to terms I had to do with how little I knew about AIDS. Um, I, had, I came to realize that AIDS had extin extinguished an entire generation of people like my uncle. Um, and I did a great deal of research uh, in making this film. Um, and it was, and like I said, it wasn't all, all terrible. It was actually really meaningful because one of the things that I discovered was that people weren't just dying. Um, people were caring for one another. People were taking to the streets and people were making art. And I discovered and was inspired by artists that, um, that I, I now are, have, have been really informative and influential for me. So I'm thinking of artists like David Wojnarowicz, um, who unfortunately died of AIDS. I'm thinking about Diamanda Galas, who made um, a work honoring her brother who died of AIDS and performed it at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City in 1990. I'm thinking about um, Tom Jocelyn and Peter Friedland's film, Silver Lake Life, The, the View From Here, um, which if you haven't seen is um, one of the most tender and, and wrenching portraits of AIDS. Um, so this research taught me uh, three things. One, that the space uh, occupied by the AIDS crisis in our national memory is disproportionately tiny relative to its horrors. Two, this national ignorance of AIDS serves to re-perpetuate the notion that AIDS was never anyone's, everyone's problem. It was somebody's problem, some people's problems, but uh, not everyone's problem, um, a fact which helped to create the genocide in the first place. And three, we are at a particularly sensitive cultural moment in which AIDS is becoming a historical phenomenon for better and for worse, I will say, because AIDS is not over and the people for whom it is not over are disproportionately uh, black and brown uh, women. Um, and as this history is being written, it is disproportionately favoring the experiences of uh, a minority of cis white men. So Memories is trying to intervene here as well. Um, and so um, in making this film, I was really confronted with, um, as I mentioned, power in the archive, but also the kind of the intersection of chance and power. There was a certain way in which all of this was unpredictable. Um, and what my, my family remembers about Miguel and how that remembrance calcifies into what we think of as knowledge or history, uh, is dependent on several things. It's dependent on who has the platform to tell that story. 
who has the will to tell it, who has the energy, who has the desire to go looking for it, and perhaps most importantly, on whether anyone might stumble upon it. So in a sense, I am fighting uh, in this film on behalf of a fantasy uncle that I wish I had had, um, but also I am trying uh, to do my best to, or do my part to redress the wrongs of the past. So um, for the second part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about Landfall, uh, my second feature documentary. Um, another film I didn't really plan to make, but then again, who plans uh, to get a hurricane, uh, category five hurricane. Uh, hurricane Maria upset everyone's plans, anyone with ties to Puerto Rico. Um, so uh, I had been thinking a lot about Puerto Rico well before the hurricane, in particular the debt crisis that has that that nobody seemed to be talking about outside of Puerto Rico, uh, which I will talk about. Um, and I'd also been thinking a lot about how disasters can scramble our sense of time. Uh, you know, debris, whether it's literal or metaphorical, is everywhere. Yet somehow, everyone maybe wants to look forward without looking back. There's a, an intense pressure to recover, to move on, to rebuild. Um, and some of this happens because of trauma, um, because it's very hard to revisit these memories of an event. The memories are like hot coals, something not to be touched. And yet commemoration um, inevitably seeps into the rhythms of everyday life. So I had also been thinking about how colonialism has a particularly brutal way of erasing collective memory, of rewriting what we might possibly know about the past so thoroughly that when we look in the mirror, we do not know or even perhaps believe in ourselves. So I'm gonna start by showing you a quote that, um, there are two quotes actually that haunted me while I was making this film. Um, one of them uh, comes from, 1901, which was a couple of years after the Spanish handed off Puerto Rico to the United States. Um, Puerto Rico was actually on the cusp of independence uh, when this happened. And uh, the US appointed a civilian governor and this is what Charles Herbert Allen had to say. He said, Puerto Rico, sorry, Puerto Rico is a beautiful island with its natural resources undeveloped and its population unfitted to assume the management of their own affairs. So here we have, I think, three ideas about what this place is. Uh, beautiful, um, uh, undeveloped, perhaps uh, signaling economic opportunity and an unfit population. Uh, I would submit that very little has changed since 1901 in terms of how the US sees Puerto Rico. The second quote is from uh, a scholar and activist who uh, published a book in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, um, a book of essays. And this phrase has um, just, just rang through me at every moment making this film. She said, we are paying the mortgage on a house in ruins, she wrote. Um, and uh, I, I, I will talk more about the $72 billion illegal debt that Puerto Rico was already in before um, the hurricane actually physically ruined Puerto Rico. Um, but when I began making landfall, I was, I was ill prepared for how ill prepared I was. Um, and what I mean by that is it's, it's a kind of a matter of you don't know what you don't know. And I think that's actually true probably for every film I make. And, and in certain cases, it's, it's part of the beauty of not knowing. Um, in my case, in the case of this particular film, I, had, I really could not anticipate, I was ill prepared for how this film would force me to confront just how robbed I had been of my own history. Um, and we had been robbed of our history. Um, and I, I become, started to realize that one of the byproducts of migration is a kind of violent forgetting that is caused um, not only by distance, but by politics. Um, and I grieve many, many things making this film and not least was uh, the history I never knew I had lost. Uh, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in September, 2017. For those of you that don't remember, um, like many millions of Puerto Ricans living in the diaspora, I experienced Maria from a distance perversely glued to a ticker tape of gruesome media images. And um, I'm sure those of you who uh, lived Katrina uh, know what I'm talking about. Um, I do not need to show these images to you. You have seen them. You probably know what they are. The perfect spiral of a monster storm, people wading through flooded streets, acres of ruined crops, and a US president throwing paper towels. 
While I was inundated with these images, my grandmother was trapped in her ninth floor condominium, needing 24 hour care and confined to a wheelchair. When the power went out, we spent many days without knowing her condition, wondering if we had to get her out of Puerto Rico and if we did, how we would. Uh, but she never left Puerto Rico. She died the next February. It's hard to quantify the grief, impotence and anger wrought by Maria, not just my own, everybody's. But 5,000, uh, which is one estimation of the death toll that was never confirmed is a good starting number. You could say that landfall is my attempt to turn that grief, impotence and anger into action. I am not an economist or a policymaker, but I can make films. So while Hurricane Maria attracted a great deal of initial media coverage, um, I was keenly aware that the world had paid far less attention to the storm that had preceded it, this $72 billion debt crisis that had already crippled Puerto Rico well before the hurricane hit. And even less, uh, even fewer people were talking about the economic um, policies that the Puerto Rican government had put into place as a way to supposedly deal with this debt, not least a series of tax laws that have made Puerto Rico the most favorable place for anyone with a lot of money, uh, at least any American with a lot of money to move if they want to keep that lots of money. Um, just today I saw in the news that two famous YouTubers, the Paul brothers, Aaron and that other guy are moving to Puerto Rico precisely because of the tax laws and that just hit the news today. Um, so this all was happening before Maria, it's continuing um, these economic policies and, and also not least a um, seven person fiscal control board that had been put in place um, to control Puerto Rico's finances by President Barack Obama. Um, nobody's really talking about that either. So uh, still to this day, there is a group of seven people that are not elected by Puerto Ricans that are in charge of Puerto Rico's money. Um, so it's a lot of different things that I was entering. Um, so Landfall tries to take this very complicated situation and examine it. Um, and it's, it's a real, it's, I think of it as a kind of kaleidoscopic examination of the interpenetration of two storms, one environmental, the other economic, and then the competing interests at play in the archipelago's recovery. So in a world that's been torn asunder, opportunists come in and they often adopt the language of recovery. People all over Puerto Rico are um, sort of under pressure to kind of move on and, and lurch into the future. People talk about this idea of opportunity that, you know, and there's a blessing in disguise of the hurricane. There's a kind of talk of a tabula rasa that Puerto Rico was wiped clean and sort of has no history. Um, I think about one young woman that I met who uh, is a cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency evangelist, she called, she said to me, um, Puerto Rico is the blueprint for the new earth. Um, so you can see all this kind of forward thinking. Um, I, I, Landfall documents Puerto Rico's present suspension between ruin and renewal and the wildly divergent utopian vig visions jockeying for prominence because um, everyone on all sides in certain ways is talking about um, what new world are we building? What must we build? Um, so I decided very early on, like I said, this was a film that was trying to take stock of a lot of complicated interpenetrating issues. Um, and the only way I thought I could achieve this holistic scope was to kind of, to deploy a, a kind of pris prismatic and non-linear structure. So the film is actually a kind of travel log, which, which, which collects stories as, as you move throughout Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a bunch of little stories that are interconnected. From the mountainous interior to the coastal glitz of San Juan, we encounter a cross section of people working to recover from the storm in contrasting ways. Some examples include Tato, who is a subsistence farmer who has lost almost everything in the storm. We have the Albinos, a family of luxury real estate agents peddling beachfront estates to the island's new investors. We have Quinn, a self-styled guru and eco-entrepreneur from Texas in search of land on which he wants to build a hyper-privatized city powered by cryptocurrency. We have Elisa, who led a group of displaced Puerto Ricans to occupy an abandoned school and turn it into a community living experiment. And we have Ura and Neisha, a young couple fighting to remain in Vieques uh, which is an offshore municipality of unparalleled beauty and also a former bombing range and testing ground for the US military. 
So these are some of the people that populate this world. And I will talk a little bit later about the rest of the people that populate this world. But when I decided I wanted to make this film, I was extremely concerned about the pitfalls of conventional post-disaster narratives and their violent side effects. Uh, I was already thinking about all these media images that I did not want to replicate. Um, I, I, I knew I had to contend with disaster film conventions, uh, ruined porn, the pitying gaze, the notion of the phoenix rising from the ashes. And to me, it wasn't ethical at all to recirculate uh, the media's traumatic imagery of the hurricane, nor was it, was it ethical to deploy a false sense of hope. Um, Puerto Rico's reality is far more complex than that. So instead for landfall, I wanted to demonstrate what I felt was an under-narrated, deep interpretation of a whole series of forces that led Puerto Rico to its current crisis. And this is a sort of laundry list of things that I wanted to connect. A 500 year history of colonialism, environmental disaster powered by climate change, debt as a Trojan horse for libertarian dystopia, gentrification, migration, and the legacy of US military violence. These are some of the issues that the film um, operates as a kind of primer trying to, trying to show. But at the same time, um, it's a film that, that, that posits the possibility of, of looking away from the typical ways that we look at disaster. What kind of spaces become opened up when we refuse to follow those, those movie rules? Um, and and for, for me, in many ways, it's about inverting um, what I felt was a second toxic narrative that I had to contend with, which is um, perpetuated largely by tourism. So if Puerto Rico exists at all in the global imaginary, it often is um, exists as a kind of paradise on display for the pleasure of visitors. Um, I really wanted to connect and disrupt what I felt was this kind of neo-colonial tourist gaze with the reductive ways that conventional documentaries cater to primarily white middle-class audiences. For a North American audience that might have visited Puerto Rico on a vacation and maybe thinks that they know it, I wanted, I want now <laughs> landfall to provoke a shift in them such that they might ask, where do I fit in here? To what extent am I ignoring Puerto Rico and its relationship to the United States? Have I been curious enough? Have I listened? Um, and I, and when I ask these questions, I also am asking them of myself, again, as a diasporic Puerto Rican who was not raised in Puerto Rico, I have never lived there. I have only visited many, many times. Um, while making landfall, I was, I was extremely self-conscious, I would say sometimes to the point of paralysis about the gaps in my understanding of Puerto Rican political reality and history. I was very scared of the pitfalls of my blind spots but this is where collaboration radically transformed the film. So I worked, I had the very great privilege of working on this film very closely with uh, Lale Namaro Pastor, who is a Puerto Rico based activist, DJ and artist who has lived in Puerto Rico since they were born there. Um, Lale and I would talk for many, many hours, um, sometimes fight about everything from um, you know the everyday violence of debt to um, to what, what should happen to Puerto Rico, to what the, diaspora, what the role of the diaspora is, um, and indeed um, also how to heal from personal trauma. Um, so I'm gonna show you a clip from the film in which Lale is reflecting on, um, we hear Lale's voice reflecting on, this is a sort of one of the, the moments of testimony um, on the aftermath of the hurricane and, and Lale's feelings about it. El mismo día que Trump llega a la isla, murieron 160 personas mientras él estaba tirándonos un bounty. No hay respeto a lo que sucedió. El mismo gobierno no tiene respeto ante el duelo. El mismo gobernador no tiene respeto. ¿Cuántas personas no murieron? Y se iban tirando y almacenando en una morgue que era un furgón, que era nevera. ¿Cuántas personas todavía no le han podido dar sepultura a sus familiares? ¿O nunca lo van a poder hacer? Porque los cuerpos estaban en tal estado de descomposición que no podían saber de quién era el cuerpo. Las personas que sobrevivieron al huracán sobrevivieron gracias a otras personas que sobrevivieron al huracán. 
Y si no hubiera sido así, no sé qué estaría pasando ahora mismo. Por So, like, uh, we, we never intended for Lale to be part of the film. Lale was uh, actually there to work with me on finding people to shoot with and uh, did archival research and lots of other things. Um, and yet I interviewed Lale kind of on a lark and um, Lale has an incredibly powerful voice and way of, of putting things. And it just, as we were editing, we were, um, we were very, moved by what Lale had to say. And, and at the same time, I was also really aware that there was something in the dynamic between us that I wanted the film to kind of posit. So the film was very quietly framed as a, as a conversation. Um, the, the film opens with um, two women sitting on a beach uh, in the dark. Um, we don't know who these people are. Well, they, ha they, are, they are Lale and me. Um, and in a lot of ways, the film is sort of quietly framed as a conver conversation between, uh, you know, sort of the traumatized and the witness to that trauma. Um, and in many ways, the film is trying to, um, to sort of posit to, if, if, if you are one of the traumatized, the film tries to hold space for that experience and for you to be able to contemplate that. And if you are um, one of the witnesses, then the film tries to Uh, to sort of invite you to sit, to sit a spell and make space um, and, 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 and perform that ethical function of witnessing. So, um, so yes, so this is basically what the sort of, um, the film is a kind of solidarity act. It, it, it tries to, um, to invite all of us to say that, you know, this is, this is a part, partly a political possibility of the film um, if you are up for it. Um, So I want to show you another clip from the film. One moment, um, and again, this is a film that's trying to think about. Again, I was going back to this idea of looking away from disaster, um, or at least looking at disaster um, differently or obliquely. I was really trying to think about a couple a couple of things I wasn't hearing in the media. Um, things like um, like affect, like the emotion of 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 living day to day in crisis. But also I think there's this expectation that, that, that those who are living in crisis are only ever victims, are only ever suffering. Um, and, and I was so um, aware of, as the more time I spent in Puerto Rico about how um, profoundly active and, and alive and full of pleasure and joy um, people in Puerto Rico are. And I was also thinking a lot about what, you know, what kinds of conversation um, create political transformation. Because for those of you that don't know, um, you know, Puerto Rico, the, the hurricane was very devastating, but two years after the hurricane, people in Puerto Rico came together um, for um, a wave of historic protests that ended up ousting the democratically elected governor um, in 12 days. And so, um, you know, the way that people tend to talk about um, people at the epicenter of crisis Um, is, is one that is deeply passive, deeply victimizing. And I wanted to show um, how, what I was seeing in Puerto Rico, which was um, a, a particularly younger generation, but a, a population that knows exactly what is happening to them, knows, knows what the score is, doesn't need to be educated, doesn't need somebody from the outside to, to, to help them. Um, they need to be, be heard. And um, so anyway, this is a scene from the film in which a group of young activists are having dinner and they're talking about the political reality. So um, just show that. Esto de momento para mí es 
después de ese tiempo frustrante como que ver todo lo que pasa en el país y, y nada, ver gente que está bien chill y, ¿verdad? También rompiendo con lo que significa la utopía para cada quien. A lo mejor la utopía es que Puerto Rico sea libre, pero a lo mejor para mi amiga es poderle darle como a sus hijos sin esa preocupación. Yo soy de los que pienso que el organismo político que está creado sobre esta isla está ahora mismo con planes de aniquilarnos, uh -huh. literalmente. Tenemos que, de alguna manera, mirar cómo nos tiramos a la calle. ¿Por qué no protestar cuando hay 300 escuelas que se cierran? ¿Por qué no protestar cuando todavía hay gente que no tiene un techo digno para vivir? ¿Por qué no protestar si todavía... Hay gente que cuando llueve se tiene que meter en, en el baño de su casa para no mojarse. ¿Por qué no protestar cuando no, no hay empleo? ¿Por qué no protestar cuando nos aumentan el crédito en la, en la UPR? Uh -huh. ¿Por qué no protestar ¿verdad? cuando nos aumentan más los impuestos y no hay beneficios para uh -huh. nosotras? Así que, ¿por, ¿por qué no protestar cuando no cuentan nuestros muertos y muertas? So, um... This is a collective portrait. Um, it's a portrait of a place. There's the, the, if there's a main character in this film, it's Puerto Rico itself. Um, and it was just really important for me for that for the film to have that kind of polyphonic feel. Um, it's also important for me for the film to, even though you see these antagonistic figures, these very um, obnoxious uh, opportunists coming into Puerto Rico, it's important for me to decenter them, for them not to take up all the space that they would like to. And uh, and so there are moments in the film where you you get to spend time with people um, in their everyday lives, in their worlds. Um, I just want to end um, by by um, showing one last clip from Lale because I always love giving Lale the last word. Um, but um, uh, it's a scene in which Lale is reflecting on um, what we, we came to identify as a kind of chronic condition uh, in Puerto Rico of uh, affliction that we, we talk about as uh, palantismo, which, um, well, Lale, Lale explains what it is. Um, so I'll, I'll let Lale explain and then I can say more. ¿Tú crees que hablar de esto te ayuda o es, es un desahogo aún como...? Yo creo que es importante volver a esa memoria porque te vuelve a... Te... Algo bien interesante, por lo menos del puertorriqueño, yo siento que yo también sufro, es que tenemos una memoria corta. Que... Tratamos siempre de, chapa, vamos a ir para adelante, para adelante, porque ese es nuestro lema. Chapa para adelante, para adelante siempre, yo me levanto, yo sigo, yo no me quito. Y tratamos de borrar esas cosas malas, tratamos de, de echarlas a un lado y yo creo que es necesario que los revivamos. Porque yo siento que a lo mejor hay personas que no, no ya, ya pasaron, pasaron la página. Y yo creo que no podemos pasar esa paz. No podemos obviar de que nos dejaron a la miseria.
so um, I'll stop sharing now. Um, I think that um, what I, I think about my grandmother actually when I'm watching that clip and I think about her as somebody who um, really never wanted to look back. She never wanted to, she was very much a balante sort of person. Um, and I think that there um, is a really potent uh, proposition that, that Lala is sort of floating. And I think um, is, is, is valuable for all of us, I think, particularly in this moment of crisis in which we all find ourselves, um, there's always a risk of normalizing crisis. There's always um, a temptation to do that. Um, and it's not to be sort of, I don't think Lala's trying to have no compassion and or, or misunderstanding of why people might want to say, I need to move on. But I think what Lala is asking is what is the risk if we move on too soon? And I would say, I would maybe just end by saying, um, maybe we should think about the opposite of that. What do we all potentially gain if we do the hard work of looking backwards? I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. That was brilliant, of course. I mean, you always sweep me away. Um, and it's fascinating to me because as, as you were watching, as I was watching that last clip, when I originally saw Landfall, I hadn't seen your first film. I hadn't seen um, Memories. But now that I watched this clip, I was thinking exactly what you and where you ended, that this was indeed, this could have been said about your grandmother, right? And, and the whole notion of not digging up or not holding on to unpleasant, painful, grief-filled moments of, of life. Um, so, I mean, I'm, well, I'm delighted that I figured that out on my own. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, your films are, are incisive, they're, they're acutely political in very different ways, but in very similar ways, you know? And one of those ways is that they're both, they're both extraordinarily beautiful. Mm -hmm. And watching the, the, this last clip again, it's almost like this aesthetic serendipity. Mm -hmm. You know, you have those doves. You didn't know those doves were there, did you? No. <laughs> um, you have earlier in the film, um, you know, these nuns and these crazy habits walking down a deserted beach on a mountain somewhere, again, mm -hmm. You know, it's serendipitous, but they're beautiful poetic moments that to me, they serve to, to sort of establish this different kind of affect that your films establish that go beyond the hitting you on the head with a political message or with a history lesson, but instead reach the individual, reach the viewer um, through almost a haptic quality of the image, right? Mm -hmm. Because you feel, you feel moved mm -hmm. in a way that traditional political documentaries don't always necessarily move you and you're, mute, you're moved by the beauty. I think I told you before that to me, one of the most stunning sequences in the film is the uh, fisherman catching lobster because it comes as a kind of a moment when you are overwhelmed with, with the grief of people that we've been seeing and, and the difficult situations that they're living in. And it comes as this moment of respite where you can take a breath and and just cherish the image for what is showing you, as opposed to trying to unearth, you know, some kind of other um, political message. And you know, thinking about both of your films reminded me of uh, something that um, Chilean filmmaker Patricia Guzman said about his own work. And it's like los pueblos sin memoria no tienen futuro. Right? And this is what your work is about. Puerto Rican Puerto Ricans without memory don't necessarily have a future of the kind we would want them to have. Mm -hmm. um, so sorry about for, for, for the long commentary. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, how you see your filmmaking intersecting with your intellectual academic background? Sure. Uh, I know you teach at Williams College, and, and I know you, I believe you're in the art department there, right? Or visual arts or yeah. something like that. Yeah. How do you, how do you manage that kind of like back and forth? Well, 
the first thing I want to say is that I, 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 I've never heard anybody compare my work to Patricio Guzman and I'll just like, I'll dine out on that for the rest of this week because um, I just absolutely adore his work and his film, The Pearl Button in particular, I was thinking about a lot when I was making Landfall, um, but about all his films, Nostalgia for the Light, I mean, the, he's, he's, he's one of these, if you want to think about politics and memory, I think he's, um, he's the first to go to. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's interesting. I, I am very glad that I, by the time I was making films, I had thought a lot about um, not only film, but theory and politics. And um, I had this very circuitous, you know, I, I, I studied English in my undergrad and then I studied gender studies and then contemporary art theory and then cultural studies. So it was just um, a veritable potpourri of training that none of it taught me how to use a camera, but um, it taught me to think about film. And I, in particular, you know, I, one of my areas of, of um, examination for my PhD was documentary. I was, I, I, I was really curious, always really interested in documentary film. And so I had read and, and I read about documentary and seen many films before I started making my own and I think in certain cases that can be kind of paralyzing right it's like oh god I've you know I've, I've seen too much <laughs> um, um, but I think in in the, I, I knew I think I knew very early on what kinds of films I didn't want to make um, I, I it's really helpful I think and even with my students I I think it's really helpful to show students what not to do or like examples of, of filmmaking that I don't agree with or that I think is you know either ethically problematic or just badly framed or badly edited you know it's it's or even just really really conventional I was so acutely aware of the conventions of documentary that um, I, I think by the time I started making uh, films I I was I, I didn't really understand until now but like for me filmmaking is never the same twice. And it's, and, and I, I always feel like um, the ideas I have will drive the form of the finished work. And rather than, oh, I'm gonna make a film about X topic and therefore I'm gonna use interviews and I'm gonna talk to this and I get some B-roll. I mean, that's, that's what most documentaries, how most documentaries get made. And I feel like I don't, I want my films to be informed by the world that, that I listen to. Um, so it kind of goes back to this idea of serendipity. I love that word. When I think about documentary, it's, um, it's always surprise that, that moves me the most. And that's, you know, one thing I didn't really talk about that much, but the film is punctuated as you, as you mentioned with these moments that we, you know, we knew what we wanted to film, but there was a lot that we just wanted to find. And I wanted the, I wanted Puerto Rico to reveal itself to me as well as to you. Um, so, so that's there, but anyway, as far as to me teaching goes, you know, I, I'm also in the department of, I'm in art and art history, the, those departments are, are together. And so I also teach art history courses, um, which is funny because I'm not really an art historian. I teach more like <laughs> theory courses masquerading as art history courses. Um, but I teach a course, for example, on, on now I teach a course on HIV and AIDS, um, in art. Uh, I'm teaching a course now called Art in Times of Crisis, um, which is actually a studio course, but I, I teach a lot of, you know, um, theory practice, uh, scholarly courses as well. Um, and yeah, so for me, it's all about praxis. And um, I, I, I think that in, unfortunately, uh, I, and I would say that I, I'm, it's, it's a lot to maintain to have an active filmmaking practice and teach full time. Um, but I will say that in the best, on the best days, um, they inform each other. And I think I'm a better teacher because I'm not always ensconced in academia. And I think in certain ways, um, I feel like a better filmmaker because I'm not hostile to, um, there's, a, I think a lot of kind of, an, there can be a kind of anti-intellectualism um, as well in the film industry. So yeah, anyway, it's, it's sort of symbiotic relationships. That's wonderful. I love it. Uh, and I love it that you use the word praxis because that's something that we've been batting around a lot in terms <laughs> of the relationship between my more traditional theory, cultural studies, communication department and our uh, digital media practices program, which, which we're trying to interconnect in, um, in more cogent ways. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about something that struck me again after seeing landfall again, but also now in the context of memories, which is um, both in both films, you are you're trying to capture the spirit of an absence, mm -hmm. right? Maria has already happened. And what's left is not visible other than with the ruins, which is not what interests you. Your mm -hmm. uncle is no longer here either, right? And when you make the film. So in both cases, they're, they're, um, they're about the afterlives of events, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, it's not, obviously, landfall is not the typical parade of horrors with, um, you know, and we're all familiar with these scenes, particularly we here in New Orleans, right? You know, the swirling images and, you know, the cat five, cat seven, cone of uncertainty, all that nonsense. And you avoid that completely, which is, you know, just absolutely stunning that you managed to do that. But you managed to do that because it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And your uncle's not there anymore. So you can unearth to your heart's content, right? And actually, mm -hmm. this is an aside, but I read somewhere, or I heard you say in an interview somewhere, um, that you were not trained as an investigative journalist. <laughs> Yeah. If you were not, I don't know who is, because what you do in both films is investigative journalism, artistic investigative journalism, right? Uh, your uncle on the one hand, and the other, the, these tremors of post Maria, but then also all the other crises that you yourself uh, mentioned in your talk. Um, but there is one thing that happens in Landfall that happens while you're there. And that's the resign Ricky, mm -hmm. the Rosselló uh, protests. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe you were there, right? Those 12 days, you were there. Well, we didn't, it's funny, we, we, we arrived just in time. <laughs> they were <laughs> unfolding and, La, you know, I was talking to Lale like every day. We, we thought we were almost done with the film. We were editing, actually. We were in the midst of an um, editing sprint. And uh, and I was checking with Lale every every minute, and at a certain point, we were like, "This is this is too big. We can't." Because that's the one of the, the hard things with documentaries is you sometimes you don't know when they're done. You know, you think I, it's in, I, I, we've got to we've got to put this thing to bed. We're running out of money, et cetera. And uh, and then so we arrived um, really like there were so many, and that's part of the reason why in the film Lale is showing me some of these things on the phone because um, you know, at the beginning of the film, she's showing me some of the highlights of the protests on her cell phone. And I quite literally was not there, I missed it. And I think that, but that's part of it too, is that, you know, there was a sense with the- with, You weren't there either. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but we were there in the very end when he did, when he did uh, resign. But part of it was that we were, we were thinking about, there is something about this moment. There are these moments in time. I think we're all living one with COVID right now where as it's happening, you know it's his, history and the, you know it's a big deal, right? You know it's something that you will never forget. And so we were thinking already like this was, and, and we were also thinking about social media and how um, this thing is already history. This thing is already an archive. Like there, there was a way in which um, people were, as it was happening, were going, oh my God, oh my God. And there was this circulation of, of video. So we wanted to kind of get to that because, because we were, even though we were there in the moment for, for the, even, even our documentation of the, um, of the protests is couched in aftermath, right? Where we, we deliberately, you know, spoiler alert, we end the film in the wake of the protests, not in the protests. And it's partly because we are trying to posit a kind of, okay, what, who are we after? Who are we in the after? Um, and that is by necessity, it is about memory, right? It is that abstract space, uh, that the abstract that is also profoundly emotional, that is material, that's in, that's in the, the remnants, that's in what's left behind. Um, and it's that's to me a, a, a really important space of politics, that sort of tussle where people start to debate over what really happened. Um, even now people are, you know, have have disagreements about about what those protests, how those protests really went down and what they mean. But um, so anyway, that's there's a there's a lot of reasons why the belatedness is important. It is. It's it's crucially important, it seems to me. And yes, of course, the way spoiler alert continued, 
the ending of the film is one of its most poetic images because again, serendipitously, your camera, you and your camera were there as this crew of street painters, I don't know what to call them, sanitation workers, swoops in and starts erasing the marks, mm -hmm. the, the, the vestiges, you know, the visible, the visible remnants of the protest when they start painting over the graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing place to end the film, of course, yeah. because it just encapsulates um, so much of what you were saying before. Okay, I can keep on going, but we do have a question question in the chat. So uh, let me ask you, this is from Clara Manel. How did you draw the line between something that may be too personal of your family to share versus what you feel like you needed to, to share? Well, I think this gets to kind of one of the crucial things about this film. I mean, this is a film about um, what to disclose, you know, and when and how. And it's 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 like precisely why, you know, the opening lines are given to somebody who's sort of warning me about the things you you are not to talk about. Um, and it's really, really hard um, to to answer, you know, um, to, to sorry, I'm just uh, sort of losing my train of thought. Um, it's it's um, it was really painful. That's what I'm trying to say to answer that question, because even though my grandparents were gone, there were consequences. I mean, I, I, there's no way I could have made this film if my grandparents had still been alive. I don't think I could have gotten over my, my fear of disrespecting them and also my sense of needing to be, to, to, to care for their feelings. Um, so there's a way in which that was, but even, you know, I mean, the film, sort of gets at my relationship with my mother. And, you know, there was, there were a lot of ways in which it was, um, it was a constant negotiation, what to disclose, what not to disclose. And, um, you know, particularly things about my grandfather, which I don't, I don't want to give away all the spoilers, but <laughs> things about my grandfather, there were definitely ethical questions about, you know, do I have the right to, to, to share these things? And ultimately, like, you know, this is a film that asks the question, you know, in a way, like, what do the living owe the dead? And, you know, if we live our lives only feeling like we owe the dead, um, which I think many of our elders might, you know, especially in, in a Puerto Rican family, um, there's a sort of sense that you, you always owe the dead. You always owe, you know, I was raised to, always respect my elders. Um, and so there's a sense that uh, the film in a lot of ways is a, is, a, is a violation of a cultural taboo that's very, very, very common, uh, not just in Puerto Rico, but in many, um, I think, communities. Um, and so, uh, you know, how did I answer it? On a case-by-case -case basis uh, with a lot of support and help and tears and, um, and it was, yeah, it was tough. Let me ask you another question, Cecilia. Um, who's your ideal spectator? Well, I don't know. The way in which for landfall, I would venture to answer for you mm -hmm. okay. um, that it's a film that is as much for the Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico as it is for the diaspora. Oh yes, I would say very much so. Um, so I would say it depends on the film and I, and I wouldn't, Okay, I'm just gonna reverse answer this because for memories, it was in a way my parents because I made a film. I remember when I first, I practiced my first academic paper in front of my parents, <laughs> which is, I would never recommend. They fell asleep, both of them fell asleep. And I said, um, I wanna make a film that my parents will, will watch and not fall asleep. But I also wanted it to be doing all the things that I cared about in my dissertation, right? It was like a sort of, I always want to find a way to make a film that is accessible to uh, an audience that is willing to, to join me, right? So it's not necessarily like making everything super clear. I want things, I want my films to re require a certain amount of engagement, but I, do, I don't want to make films that are so hard to um, access that you have to have a PhD to, to understand them, right? Um, but that being said, I am also thinking with specific films of like particular audiences. And in the case of Landfall, for example, as you're saying, 
I just really, really wanted to invert. I could even sense with some of the, the funders that, that very, you know, were wanting to support the film and they, you know, believed in the film, couldn't really get a sense of their own biases on, on what they expected this film, who they expected the film to cater to. And there was a certain, there were moments when, you know, I would be getting feedback from people who had, you know, given, you know, grants to the film, et cetera, would be sort of wanting things to be more explicitly spelled out. Mm -hmm. And I would push back and I would say, you know, like for me, the, the, the litmus test was always, at what point am I catering so much to an audience that is not Puerto Rican and particularly that's not based in Puerto Rico that I am insulting people in Puerto Rico, that the film is no longer for them. And so the, for me, the most important ethical like, and, and, and artistic priority was to make a film that would, that would matter to people in Puerto Rico and then the diaspora and then everybody else. Um, and so, um, that, you know, I'll just give an example. There's a scene towards the end of the film during the protests when people are singing uh, this song, Emi Viejo San Juan, which if you're Puerto Rican, it's like in your DNA, you're like born with the tattoo of the lyrics. It's like, you know, everybody knows this song and it's about a person who leaves Puerto, Puerto Rico never to return. And it's a profoundly nostalgic song that my father would sing to me and everybody's father would sing to, you know, everybody, everybody knows these lyrics. And there was something really beautiful about the fact that people in the midst of this protest chose to sing this song in Viejo San Juan, in the site that the, you know, the song is longing for. Um, and we chose not to translate those lyrics on purpose. You know, we thought about it. We said, oh, you know, we have to explain all this. Like you should, you know, there's this layer of meaning. No, we don't explain. I didn't even notice that it wasn't translated. <laughs> That's my oh, bad. Oh, of course, because you know the song, right? And, and so my hope is that there, I'm always trying to figure out ways for a film to work on multiple levels rather than to water it down so it works on all the levels. Does that make sense? It's like, I want it to be something that there's something, and, and, and the same is true for, for Memories of a Penitent Heart. There's, there are little nuggets in there for certain viewers. Like for the Broadway fans, there are little nuggets. For, you know, for the AIDS survivors, there, there are a lot of nuggets. For, you know, like it's, it's I'm, I'm thinking about how to, um, yeah, how to sort of work all that in. Um, yeah, they're little Easter eggs, if you will, I think, in the films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that are so striking as just um, your visual flair. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of memories of, of that crocheted bedspread. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, that was a very polarizing um, bedspread. I, um, I was told to take it out. So this is when I was first starting to make, you know, it's very, very scary to make your first film, especially when you've got people giving you advice. Um, I was in a lot of like these labs for work in progress, you know, for emerging filmmakers. And um, I was in a feedback session with a very, very, very um, like established, well-known, very, uh, and, and a sort of, um, a Titanic figure in the field, you could say. And, um, and this person, hated that bedspread and said, I don't get it. I don't get it. Get it out of here. This is, this doesn't make any sense. So, you know, why am I watching? Why are, why am I looking at this bedspread? And I said, I <laughs> well, I said, I said to this person, I said, um, you know, you wouldn't ask a poet to explain the meaning of their poem. And, uh, and yeah, th that didn't work. But then, but then I finished, I stuck to my guns. I kept it in the film. And then and then this person came to see the world premiere of the film and said, you kept it in. And I was like, yeah. And, he, and they said, it, it was amazing. They, they, lo they loved it again. So yeah, I, I think you should stick to your guns uh, if you feel strongly about something. Don't let the, don't let the, um, you know, the, 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 the big wigs push you around. That's what I'm trying to say. That's fantastic, Cecilia. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, My pleasure. You know, a lot of fun to talk, talking to you and listening to you um, talk about your own films, uh, not in a conversation, but as a, a as a very coherent and and um, life project. So, yeah. one last quick question. Yes. What are you doing next? Well. Um, 
Oh, I um, it's funny, you know, I was working on a different film before landfall. I'm, I'm uh, hopefully, hopefully this year, finishing a film about my high school experience. And it's very funny and very different. And um, I'm basically reenacting some of my um, my most traumatic teen memories. Oh God. <laughs> uh, and we'll see Orlando on screen, huh? Yes, yes, you will indeed see Orlando on screen. And, my family uh, lives in Orlando, so I I, uh, I empathize. <laughs> right, so not always in the best light, I will say. But um, yes, it's a film for anybody who hated high school. And, uh, and <laughs> <Most it's, of laughs> right, and it's actually going to be funny. So it's nice to make a funny film for a change. So it's going to be awesome. I just noticed that there's one other question. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 It's from uh, Clarice Castillo Lopez, uh, actually, Mitocaya, and I know her well. Hi, Cecilia. Thank you for talking to us. I have two questions. One, you approach Landfall from a different angle than other disaster movies. Is there any subject that you hope to explore someday? That you would also want to approach from a different angle. <laughs> I, I think we're pointing to your high school. Yeah, uh -huh. no, I mean, I, I'm definitely making this high school movie from a different angle, and um, I have to say, I, 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 it's, it's really interesting to mine your like pop cultural um, touchstones because I never realized just how much I, I love high school movies <laughs> until I started making this. I was like, oh right, I've seen that one and that one and that one and that one. Um, so yes, I'm making a high school movie, but from the inside out. So I think that answers that question. <laughs> okay, and her, Clarice's second question is, you mentioned being ni de aquí ni de allá, neither from here nor from there. How has that changed or influenced your approach to filmmaking? Um, I think it's, uh, it means I'm always looking for gray. <laughs> and I don't mean gray in a sad way. I mean shades of gray. I mean nuance. It's some. Um, I'm never going to have a really black and white. I'm always going to be trying to say, and then maybe it's also this. Um, I think um, it's been very interesting to make this film that has enabled me to feel simultaneously more Puerto Rican than ever. And also a feeling of responsibility that it's important for me as somebody who doesn't live in Puerto Rico to always name that and not, um, not assume that I know things I don't know. Um, and so there is that sense of, yeah, I'm always gonna be somebody who is profoundly hyphenated. And I think that just enables me to be um, a little wilier than I'll put it, <laughs> yeah. Dean Edwards, you're back with us. Well, I felt, I, I wanted to, um, I felt your kind of wrapping up mode. And you just froze. <laughs> Do you hear me okay? I think, um, okay. So I felt you're wrapping up mode on us. So I don't want to cut you off from saying your thank yous and, good, and, and goodbyes, but I know that I really wanted to thank Cecilia uh, for joining us tonight and Anna for a wonderful conversation, just bringing out um, just the kind of complexity, the beauty, the, you know, and the commitments to, that, you, that you have in your work. Um, you are an absolutely, inspiring filmmaker and thinker. Uh, I too loved it when you used the word praxis. <laughs> um, and um, oh, you did. <laughs> yeah. and so I, I, you're just, you know, an ideal person to, to speak in this series. And so I want to thank you for taking the time and sharing your work with us um, okay. and kind of being with us <laughs> this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, as Bobby uh, Yan said earlier, it, it really is, um, I know, inspiring to all of us, um, faculty, community, and students, and I certainly hope that, and can expect that there's a young filmmaker, a media maker um, in the audience tonight that's really, many of them um, who are inspired by what you're saying. So you're a wonderful teacher and, and artist. So thank yeah. you for thank you the, so all much. you said. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. I loved it. <laughs> there's Bobby. Yes, thank you, Cecilia. Thank you so much. It was wonderful and very insightful and your, your art is pure and from the heart and I definitely felt it. And I'll, I'll just say this, I hope it's not just media makers or filmmakers, I hope you can inspire everybody that's listening beyond that. So, thank you. Thank you. People are adding in in the chat, alums, we have, I sort of mentioned the alums that are also happy, Tulane alums who are joining us. So um, thanks again. And this would be the time in the evening when we would just repair to the other side of the room for some sort of reception. So let me encourage all in the audience to go repair to whatever room you're in. <laughs> And hopefully there is set out a nice little buffet and and with a bartender or something. Yeah, but I keep collecting a rain check. Yeah. So I'm hoping I'll get another, you know, 
maybe we'll, we'll uh, meet at the film festival next year or something. That's right. We really hope it's an, it's a real a warm um, welcome to you. Let us know when you're coming back down here um, for the film festival. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. yeah. Thank you so uh, much. Thank I, you. I, before you go, Cecilia, tell everybody your social media handles so people can follow you and find oh, you. Oh, you know, I'm always forgetting to post those in here. Thank you. Um, it's just one of those things I'm terrible at. Um, let me just dig them up. <laughs> I always, I should have them at the ready and I just, um, I always forget. It's, I've got like three of them, so hold on. Um, I know you, it's like when people ask my phone number, I have to look it up. Exactly, <laughs> I just have to get my, um, oh dear. Bobby, why don't you share yours? Because I know you've yeah, got, uh, that's I think good everybody, idea. it's a good time to share. Uh, idea. Sure, my, uh, my Instagram is pretty simple. It's just Mr. Bobby Ann. And my website is bobbyant.com. That's it. It's pretty simple. Awesome. Great. And I will give this to you one second. Here they are. Okay. I have a whole bunch of them. And uh, there you go. Can put it, we can also okay. put it. Oh, there you go. You I think it. I succeeded. Wow. That's great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm 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 pretty bad at um some the the personal ones, but the, the the most important ones are to follow the film um, because we're going to be on PBS in the summer. So um, we definitely want people to find out and tell your families and friends that they'll be able to see it um, as part of our broadcast. And we're planning a whole bunch of events. So yeah, great. When I was introducing the series, I, I, I had a little um, typo in my notes and instead of it's, it's called the Bobby and Lectureship in Media and Social Change. And I reversed it and I started to say social media and change. <laughs> and now we've come come around full circle. It can be media, social media, and social change and change. So there yeah. you go. Um, so so follow cool. Cecilia, follow Bobby, follow Tulane SLA on our social media and uh, where we also promote these. And we'll have this event up on our website, which is a nice perk um, of, of, that's one silver lining of Zoom. Um, and so we'll be able to share it there. And I know others will come back to watch this um, in the future. So again, thanks everyone. Hey, Brian, is that the capital? What's that? You cut out. Yeah. Is that oh. disaster capitalism? <laughs> the, the bright light at the end of the tunnel, the silver lining on the cloud. The silver lining on the cloud, I guess. Yeah. But well, we won't charge for it. So there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, so thanks everybody and have a wonderful evening. Um, those of us down in New Orleans, it's probably almost as cold as it is up at Williamstown, uh, Massachusetts. You might be surprised. Oh. <laughs> so, Hi, I feel um, that so for you. Yeah, and our friends in Texas, I know are really, we're also thinking about them as they're really struggling right now. So anyway, with that, good evening to all. We'll look forward to seeing you all in many different venues in the future. Thanks. All right, thank you all. Thanks. Good night, thank you again. <laughs>